Great. So I'm going to talk about the baseline assessment tool and specifically how it's used in Malawi to collect data on oxygen availability. So just a little bit con of context before, there are actually three baseline assessment resources in the oxygen delivery toolkit. So the first is the baseline assessment manual, and that's the one that actually provides operational training for those who are involved in conducting a baseline assessment of the current status of the oxygen delivery system, um, as well as pulse oximetry and other barriers to access. And then the second Hello? tool- Hello? Could I interrupt yes? you for just one second? Would you be a kid to open your camera? Is it possible? It's yes. always nicer. That would be great. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry to for interrupting you. No worries. And please do speak slower um, because we are being uh, there's interpretation, so it's always uh, better to speak slower. Okay. Thank you, and it's a reminder for no myself too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and then the I think I was on the second resource um, in the oxygen delivery baseline assessment tool. So the baseline assessment survey tool uh, can be downloaded as an Excel or uploaded onto survey CTO to do online data collection. Um, this is the actual form with the assessment questions for when you're going through a facility to try and um, gauge oxygen equipment and supplies availability. And then lastly, there's a training PowerPoint, which describes in detail how you can administer the survey. So just before the COVID pandemic, the baseline assessment tools were used in Malawi to provide critical data on oxygen access in key district and central level health facilities. So the baseline assessment was rolled out in 21 um, central and regional and district referral hospitals. And so those are higher level facilities in Malawi and more likely to supply oxygen. Um, and then when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, the baseline assessment provided a precedent to do biomedical equipment surveys over an expanded set of facilities and collect critical information on oxygen gaps and availability um, of supplies to actually treat COVID-19 patients. I think we'll go to the next slide. Okay, so I'll write a little more detail here on what's actually included in the baseline assessment manual itself. So the manual is focused on supporting high quality data collection for anyone who is based in country or at a health facility. Um, it includes training expectations and plans for data collectors, as well as guidance on how to create a data collection team and designate roles among that team. Um, it also includes recommendations for survey implementation, and that really digs into what it's like to conduct a survey and how data collectors can avoid potential pitfalls um, Well collecting data. So in Malawi, this guidance was rapidly implemented to train a team of Ministry of Health data collectors, both for the baseline assessment prior to the pandemic and then also during the COVID pandemic. Um, again, like I said, the baseline assessment was covered 21 district and regional referral hospitals. Um, and then the expanded facility assessment during COVID-19, which we call the biomedical equipment survey, that actually covered 76 facilities. Um, the two collected slightly different data. So the one that was conducted during COVID-19 um, had a couple more data points in it related to oxygen respiratory care. But the, um, the baseline assessment was actually really important in collecting data on critical care capacity. So that's a major constraining factor when we're talking about how many patients can receive oxygen in a hospital. Um, the second biomedical equipment survey was uh, very critical to estimate how much total oxygen production capacity is in your health system, and then also estimate demand across the health system. And I think I can go to the next slide or maybe pass it off to our next presenter. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Please go ahead, Spike. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, my name is Spike Nowak. I am based in Hanoi and work for PATH. I'm presenting on behalf of a colleague, Ching Wen, who couldn't make it tonight, um, but most of this analysis is her work. Um, and, so the- and, and just one last thing, Spike, please, you please slow down when you speak in English for interpretation. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. No problem. Uh, so I'm gonna present briefly on PATH's uh, quantification and, and costing tool. 
Um, so this tool is an Excel-based tool that is used to quantify the potential need for both oxygen and pulse oximeters. Um, this can be used to calculate, anticipate costs over time with different sorts of devices. Um, there's a background document uh, and there's also an Excel-based tool for this. Um, this tool is meant to be used for, uh, with decision makers and implementers. Uh, and it's really, really useful for thinking about the long-term cost trade-offs when it comes to these different oxygen sources. Um, as this pandemic has played out, we've been thinking about um, what is best for a health system, what should we be spending global fund dollars on, USAID money on, World Bank money on, should we purchase more oxygen cylinders, more concentrators, should we concentrate on liquid oxygen systems? Which of these different oxygen sources uh, is more cost effective in the long run? Uh, where should these Ministry of Health dollars be, be put? Um, there is a, a psychological problem though sometimes is that um, we will often focus on the capital expenditures, the costs that we have to deal with today and ignore the long-term operational expenditures. Um, so something like an oxygen concentrator is gonna cost you a lot more money today than an oxygen cylinder. But um, in the long run, if you look at the four-year lifespan of a concentrator, and if you think you're going to use it a decent amount, it can be much more cost-effective to purchase um, an oxygen concentrator rather than a cylinder and have to pay for those deliveries of oxygen a lot. This might also, um, you know, it gets into some of the distribution issues too. So those are also taken into account, or at least the costs uh, with this tool. It's also highly customizable. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk about that. Um, so the Excel-based tool is pretty easy to use. Um, it does require the user to, to um, input um, some country-specific data. Some countries, there's default data in there for that we have worked with in the past, but um, Vietnam isn't one of those, so we had to input that data ourselves. Um, you can look at things like bed count. Uh, you can look at it at the facility level or the health system level. So if you want to plan for, say, a health system that had um, I don't know, 500 different facilities, uh, maybe some provincial hospitals, district hospitals, health centers. Um, you can put all those inputs in. You can put in inputs on the sources of electricity, um, the number of beds, the occupancy rates, uh, also what you think the oxygen flow rates might be. So um, again, highly customizable. It's good if you want to think about the cost for just one facility or many. Now, one thing that was very useful here in Vietnam is that we had done a baseline assessment beforehand. Uh, we had worked with the Ministry of Health to survey 75% of all health facilities in the country. Um, it had a very good idea about how far they were away from sources of oxygen, um, what uh, the sources were in facilities, what percent of facilities had cylinders or concentrators or liquid oxygen. So we had some very good data thanks to that baseline assessment to really use this tool. So um, encourage anyone to, to start with that baseline. Now, if we can go to the next slide, I'll speak a little bit about um, how we use this in Vietnam for a very specific example. So Vietnam was lucky throughout most of the pandemic through a lot of hard work um, from the government here, it was able to maintain a very, very low case load. Uh, but then, over the past, um, over the summer, really, um, cases shot up in, in near uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so there was a real need for, for oxygen in that city, and they started to think about this a lot more. Um, but now cases are starting to go down again, and the government has put out um, a policy for different indicators uh, that provinces need to think about for opening back up. Again. One of these indicators uh, is that each health station uh, Commune Health Center here should have two oxygen cylinders. Uh, when we heard this from our Ministry of Health partners, we think immediately there's a tool for this. Um, is that the, the best decision? Should we be thinking about trade-offs? Is there something we want to tell our partners where maybe concentrators uh, would be better? So we looked at three different scenarios um, to analyze you know, what's better. Uh, is it two concentrators? I'm uh, sorry, two cylinders or concentrator? Um, we looked at a, say, an urban health center that's within 20 kilometers from a filling station. 
we looked at a semi-rural center that was 50 kilometers from a health station or from a filling station. And then we looked at a third scenario for a very rural facility that was over 100 kilometers away from a source of oxygen. Um, and then we compared, um, you know, what was going to be cheaper at all of these facilities? Would it be uh, cylinders or concentrators over a four-year lifespan? And that's what you'll see on the slide. So looking at the first scenario, um, in urban settings where they're close to uh, a place where you can refill oxygen, those cylinders are going to be cheaper um, because you just don't have to pay for high delivery costs. But when you start to go out farther away from, um, uh, from the filling station, you do have to pay more for these transport costs and, and the logistics are gonna get more expensive. So then concentrators uh, actually become a cheaper option. Um, also, we did some more analysis on this. And if the demand was increased to say four cylinders a week, then those concentrators become a much better option. Um, they become much cheaper in the long run because you're not having to pay for trucks to go out to the health. Now, this is just one thing to think about. Um, a lot of concentrators, the flow rate can't be above 10 liters per minute, um, where you might a patient might need more oxygen than that. So these are things that the, the Ministry of Health also has to tackle. This is just looking at the cost question. Um, so we were able to give this analysis to our Ministry of Health partners uh, and help them weigh some of these costs. We're waiting to see what they end up choosing uh, to do in the long run, but I think you know at least giving this um, these different options to the different provinces so um, they can plan where they want to put their resources, especially for these, these health centers that are very, very far away. So if we go down to the next slide. Um, at the end, this analysis uh, came up with some, some simple recommendations, which I kind of previewed uh, a second ago. Uh, 40 liter cylinders are really good uh, if you're looking at an urban setting that is close to a source of oxygen that can refill them. Um, they'll be relatively cheaper than um, than oxygen concentrators. Uh, but if you look at um, facilities that are farther away, then you wanna start thinking about oxygen concentrators. There are trade-offs, oxygen concentrators can break, uh, but at least for the cost um, component, uh, they tend to be uh, a better um, long-term solution. Uh, so that's one quick example from Vietnam where we use this tool, uh, but you know it could be used for many, many others as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very uh, clear uh, example of, uh, and we have a few questions and we'll tackle the question. Thank you very um, much, Georgina and Paul, for your questions. We will uh, have time to address them. Um, and I'd like to give the floor to um, Ravi Doshi, a market dynamics associate, who is going to talk to us about Kenya as an example, and he's going to focus on, on the challenges of uh, distribution system, procurement, and management, and, um, of, and training our resources. Hi. Yes, uh, hello, bonjour to everyone on the call and thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Ravi Doshi. I'm an associate with the Market Dynamics team at PATH uh, based in Washington, DC and uh, great to join this call uh, this morning. Um, so I'm gonna quickly discuss the electricity planning guide, which is another component of uh, the oxygen toolkit that, that PATH has created. Um, this tool, I think, you know, amongst the, the others is also quite unique because the recommendations are not necessarily only specific to oxygen, but are specific to all medical devices that require electricity, which is sort of the, the vast majority of any complex equipment that you consider um, from things like infusion pumps um, and syringes to, um, to the oxygen equipment, such as oxygen concentrators and even heavier infrastructure when we think of oxygen, such as PSA plants um, and even uh, air separation units, which are the very large industrial units operated often by industrial gas manufacturers to produce oxygen. Um, so what this guide does is it informs country stakeholders on how to improve the way that uh, electromedical devices are deployed and used at healthcare facilities and also provides recommendations um, on general electricity monitoring for health facilities and healthcare systems. So what we often find, and one of the, the reasons for developing this guide was is that the monitoring that is often done uh, for electricity within a health facility only covers the very basic of whether 
grid electricity is available or not at a certain facility. But when you go consider the facility context, whether electricity is available or not is only the first part of the question, how regularly it is available. And when you consider sort of many other factors related to electricity, so we have voltage surges, we have sags and surges, there's outages, there's spikes, uh, there's deviations in the frequency. All these sorts of elements affect uh, how well equipment can be used and uh, whether that equipment will be damaged or not and how to protect against that damage. So to starting at the beginning of determining how to collect data about a facility's electricity usage and electricity access, and then the guide dives more into specific recommendations for protecting devices, ensuring efficient deployment of devices, given whatever the context of electricity is within a specific health facility. So this guide can really be taken from a macro level to say how best should uh, stakeholders in the Ministry of Health collect data about electricity within their health facilities, and then bring it down to the micro level and say, what sort of intervention specifically would certain facilities or groups of facilities need to best ensure that they can um, deploy their devices well and efficiently. Um, so I'm gonna just hop to the next slide. So we uh, use this guide just, just prior to actually publishing the guide, uh, Pat had completed a survey of uh, different facilities uh, across a few counties in Kenya and from the initial data that we had prior to completing the survey, we noted that there was sort of different levels of uh, electricity access uh, within different counties. So as you can see from the small map, uh, within the eastern and northeastern parts of the country, the percentages of facilities that reported availability of electricity was lower than those in Nairobi and the central region. But again, as I mentioned, that was only one part of the question. So when we actually looked into specific facilities across different counties, we noted that many of them experienced outages and even having generators on site didn't necessarily reduce the duration of outages. So even if you know a facility says that it has electricity access, it again doesn't answer all the questions about what different challenges it faces. And even if it may have uh, uh, a generator, for example, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that generator protocol or that generator is being used uh, to its best capacity to prevent uh, long duration outages and, and thus you know, ensure that medical equipment can continue to be operated. Um, so I think you know, from that example of uh, Kenya, we can kind of note some key recommendations. So one is to ensure that facilities have power continuity. So the guide goes in depth in terms of different power continuity options. So generators are a great example. Um, there's also uninterrupted power supply devices that are especially important in the oxygen context when you're thinking that if you have a number of patients um, you're treating with COVID, for example, who are reliant on a concentrator or um, an on-site uh, PSA plant, then that, you know, an outage doesn't stop those patients from receiving oxygen for some time period. So definitely important to consider those requirements. There's also um, voltage um, protection devices and surge protection devices that are especially critical to ensuring that equipment isn't damaged whenever um, the power from the grid cuts out. Uh, so this guide really provides a very comprehensive approach um, to facility electricity monitoring and then to implement specific recommendations on ensuring that devices can continue to be used.